Joan, you mentioned how you began this five years ago, with, and uh, we can see in the film that things have transpired since then. You couldn't have predicted uh, five years ago. So when you were beginning, what, what did you have in mind? Well, I originally came to it through the Island of Animals. Um, I read an article in Bloomberg and was fascinated that it was kind of like this little known project of extravagance. People knew about the shoes, but not about depopulating the island of all its people and bringing African animals on a boat um, who were then kind of left to fend for themselves after the Marcuses were exiled. So I thought it was kind of this amazing symbol of the consequences of wealth and power, but then when I got into it and then when the election happened, it kind of moved from the symbol to a metaphor that was ended up being more about political dynasty and inbreeding. So uh, have you done some photography or filming on the island before you even got to Amal de Marcos or something? No, it was actually really unusual because all of my films before this have started with a picture, but this, I read this article by this journalist Bill Malore who ended up working with me and helping me get access in the beginning to all of the players who were all in their 80s and 90s and so I felt like it was this kind of, we had to move fast and tell this story. Um, so we went on a kind of first trip and we stayed on the island for several days and we interviewed Mrs. Marco, so we interviewed kind of all the main players um, and then that was kind of the beginning of it. Mel Marcos has such a strong bubble of self-mythology around her um, that I wonder, you know, to be in her company over an extended period of time like you were, do you, like, do you feel like you have to participate in the self-mythology in order to be there and, and or did you feel like, was, were there openings to try to uh, have a critical conversation with her? I mean, you really have no choice when you're with Mrs. Marcos but to kind of take in her worldview. Um, in some ways, she's a challenging character because she doesn't really have any character development. She sticks to the story and she stuck to it from day one to the end. I actually thought when I started that it might be a redemption story where at this time in her life, she might look back and say, well, that was a mistake, but we've changed and we want to do this. And, I was actually really, really blown away the first time I went to Bon Bon Marcos's office and he had all of the pictures from the palace of the family. I just thought as a contemporary politician, he might but separate that's not a good look anymore. himself. But no, they really leaned into it. And so um, I think my challenge as a filmmaker was how do I tell the audience that it's her view and it doesn't align with any objective historical account or the first person testimonials. And so when I started, I thought I might stay in the character's world like I have in other films, but I found I needed to go out and talk to truth tellers and people that the audience could give the audience a more um, reliable. And it was kind of that challenge of having an unreliable narrator because I realized when people are watching a film, they trust what the filmmaker is putting in front of them. And so in the structure, we really have to play with it. If it wasn't right next to the untruth, you would just believe it. Uh, can you talk about your experiences going out and meeting those other truth tellers and, uh, and dissidents? Yeah, I mean, that was amazing education to kind of hear about the martial law accounts and um, Edda and May were so inspiring and when I, and, he, and when we first met them, they were kind of gonna be you know, one-time interviews. But the way history started repeating itself, then it was so interesting and, um, and kind of scary to go back to them and have their real-time reaction to what was going on. Because I think like all of us, and like so many people in the Philippines, they never imagined it could happen. It's like May said, we were so complacent and we just assumed we had moved on. Um, so, and, they, and they're very brave to speak out now um, under a government that doesn't really support freedom of press or criticism. Um, let's take some questions from the audience. Uh, raise your hand, I'll call on you. Yes, see one third row there. Why did she do this? And are you dealing with any sort of like wrath from her right now or any sort of repercussion with the film? 
So uh, well, the question was, why did she do this? And now that reviews of the film are starting to make their way in the world, is there any blowback? And I just wanted to acknowledge Marissa, our Filipino producer, Marissa Palatan, who I, because she really brought up me, introduced me to Etta and May, and, and a lot of those people who ended up being so amazing. Um, Amelda Marcos, why did she do it? I think she wanted to tell her story at that point. I think, um, you know, you can kind of see how she sets the tone for what she is going to say, like when she's talking about all of the dictators that were her dear friends. She's kind of set up photographs, um, a kind of installation. And, um, and I think a lot of her energy is kind of putting forward that legacy that she wants to tell. And I also wanted to hear it. I felt like it was important to kind of really get her worldview, which ended up being so influential for especially the young population and the young voting population. Um, but she hasn't seen it yet. We just finished it last week, so we don't know. <laughs> The question is, yeah, sorry. Do Anna and May feel that they're in danger? Um, I mean, I think that anybody who speaks out um, does put themselves in some danger. Um, I think, in a way, it's been an unfolding drama about how much, because again, it's like people don't really think it can happen until it happens. Um, the um, one of the big reporters there, Maria Ressa, is now facing um, charges by Duterte, as you saw, Lenny Robredo is now facing charges. But the thing about Etta and May is they are brave, incredible women, and they've been here before. They, they stood for what they believed in in martial law. They have devoted, they, they feel like part of their kind of job is educating people about what happened. And they also are all older, they call themselves the grandmothers, and they just feel like that's what they're gonna do. Um, and so I think they do take a risk, but they, they know what they're doing. And, um, and yeah, it was kind of amazing how so many of these brave kind of souls ended up being women. Um, and Andy, of course, is also very brave and is um, in the United States now. Um, yeah. Stylistically, this is a departure for you because you're drawing upon archival and other layers. Can you talk about that? Yeah, it was really different for me, both the archival, um, the historical element. Um, I think my editor, Per Kierkegaard, and really brought a lot to the table in terms of bringing in the style of the archival. I think we worked really hard to not have the archival I never wanted to make a historical doc and I never wanted to make a biopic. So in that way, um, it was kind of true to my kind of way of seeing the world and, and trying to do something symbolic that would, would also not just be about the Philippines, but would be about what's going on in our world. And so we tried to use the archival as to kind of illustrate the character and bring us into the story. Um, Amelda was somebody who lived in the past, and so to understand her, you have to understand the past, but we try not to kind of take you into history as an education, but more as a way to understand the story, a kind of history of the present. And one of the things that's happened as the story started to change, and as the election started to drive the story, is the history became the present in a really unbelievable way. Like, we had, we knew about the um, stealing five to ten billion dollars and the jewelry and all these things that happened like in the past in 1986. But when um, when Bong Bong started to become a viable candidate, that's when, in a way, there started to be more scrutiny. And the PCGG had kind of chugged along all this time. But while we were shooting, was when all of a sudden there was a raid on all of Mrs. Marco's homes where they went after the paintings. And so that was while we were filming. And so, and then again, as it got close to the election, people started getting activated about martial law, like the protesters and activists. And so 
in a way, that was part of the stylistic part, was kind of blending the history and having it really tell the story of the present. All right, we'll take one more question. You least in the Philippines. We don't know yet, um, but we hope so. <laughs> uh, well, you are the first audience of the festival to see the film. I want to remind you, you can vote for your favorite films at tip.net uh, slash vote. There's another uh, screening in, a, in the next couple days, so please tell your friends. Hope you get to see more films this week. I hope you get to see more documentaries this week. Thanks very much for coming. Thanks, guys, for joining